Okay, uh, thank you all. Uh, let me uh, start where the movie left off. Uh, the, after launch, there's three phases of, main phases of commissioning. There's commissioning the spacecraft, which is in orange. You can see the deploy complete milestone 20 days after launch. Uh, then there's the OTE commissioning phase. That's the optical telescope element, so the telescope. And you can see that takes 80 days. It's a really long procedure. There are 16, uh, 18 segments and, and so on. So uh, I'm going to show you three slides on that. Uh, and then there's the uh, commissioning of the science instruments, SI, which takes 40 days. Um, and I just want to highlight uh, also during the science uh, instrument deployment phase, um, there's a test about uh, a thermal slew test. So the telescope uh, will point in a configuration that makes it uh, get relatively warm, uh, and then it'll slew to a configuration where it's relatively cool. And they will, uh, the people who are doing the commissioning will see how the telescope changes its optical characteristics and how the instruments behave with that slew. And as, if it works well at the two boundaries, then everything in between should be good. All right, so uh, three slides about the, uh, about the telescope, um, telescope uh, commissioning. This is a, a simulated image, uh, actually it's a simulated mosaic of many images. The dashed lines are the two near cam uh, modules, so that's about two by four arc minutes, slightly larger. And the blobs, each blob is a different uh, segment of the mirror after launch, after they've been separated, you know, raised up from the support that it uses during launch. They're going to be out of focus and tilted and the wrong shape, and they're going to be spread all over the sky like this. So uh, over the next 80 days, uh, there's a, a very long and elaborate process to commission the telescope. The first step is to locate all of those blobs by doing the mosaic identify which one is which by moving each segment one at a time and see which blob moves. Then um, make, bring them all into one near cam uh, small shortwave detector, put them in a hexagonal pattern so you can still see where they are and sort of visually remember which one they are. Do phase retrieval on each of those, which means take them in and out of focus, analyze it in all of those different uh, settings and figure out what the prop, how the shape is m malformed. Each mirror segment has six degrees of freedom for adjusting it plus a radius of curvature correction. So you've got all the segments times all those adjustments. A lot of free de uh, degrees of freedom. Stack the images on top of one another. Um, and so now at this point, um, they're not phased, the different segments, but they're all sort of aligned and, and, and good individually. So then you move to the co-phase, the ensemble of segments. So there's a d dispersed hartman shack sensor, which when I show you the movie shortly, you'll see these uh, uh, spectra that flare out. So that, that uh, helps with figuring out the relative phasing. And then there's also weak lenses in near cam, which purposely defocus the image. And they will have actually been repurposed for some science as well. But at this point, they're being, they'll be used for what their, their purpose is, which is to, again, see out of focus images where you know how much you moved it out of focus. Then um, you start moving this pattern around. At this point, the telescope is actually phased in the right shape for a single field point in the near cam field of view, but you want to move it around uh, to different places in the near cam field of view and then eventually to different instruments to uh, make sure that you don't have something that's uh, like 2 pi out of phase or, or something like that that you couldn't tell when you were looking at just one field point. Um, and then there's the thermal slew that I discussed. So then you move the telescope and you go to a different thermal con configuration and see how it changes. And then over the life of the mission, um, every two days is the nominal plan to, to sample the wavefront uh, uh, quality using the weak lenses. And then no more often than every two weeks and hopefully longer than that um, as necessary, uh, do corrections to the mirror segments to um, keep the, the figure of the mirror in the, the wavefront error budget. Um, and these wavefront sensing and control will take up about 1% to 2% of the, the mission lifetime just spent keeping the mirror figured. So we're going to go through these steps very quickly in a movie. I might say a few words that might just distract you. So this is the initial uh, identification phase. They, they're spread all over and we're trying to bring them onto the same near cam detector. The issue is that the course moves are not very precise. They're not exactly predictable, so they don't go to the exact position they should be right away, and so they have to then be smaller moves. 
And then there's a whole process of uh, this is the stacking, and then you bring them back out again and, and rephase them. This process is uh, not deterministic. Uh, there's a bunch of loop back to an earlier step. If, if when you do a course jump, you know, things change in a way you didn't expect or was, um, it, you know, the, the course move uh, did more poorly than you expected, so you can go back and do the fine phasing again. And the moving to different spots is done multiple times. Um, but the net result in the end, of course, is uh, a beautifully phased six and a half mirror telescope. This is an example of the going in and out of focus uh, to do the phase retrieval. The lines were those dispersed Hartman shack sensors that help you decide whether the different uh, uh, independently tuned segments are actually phased with each other. Uh, okay. Well, I don't want you to feel cheated. There you go. That's the end of the movie. Um, let's see. I thought. Yeah, I guess I just want to go back a couple slides for a moment. Um, so this paper here, this is an SPIE paper, um, but it has a beautiful description of all of this stuff if you, if you, wanna, if you wanna know more about all these uh, phases. All right, so the mission is gonna actually be operated from uh, Space Telescope Science Institute, which is different than Hubble. Uh, Hubble was done at Goddard Space Flight Center. We repurposed uh, part of the third floor of our building, and these are pictures from a, a few months ago. Uh, and actually, in the last month, we, we had our first connection with the Deep Space Network, the, um, the dishes that will be used to uplink commands and down, downlink data. Uh, and so work is ongoing. There will be uh, rehearsals between now and launch, so it's going to be very busy. All right, let's talk about um, the constraints. I want to spend a few slides now on, because there's this giant sun shield that's necessary for the science to let the telescope cool passively, there are constraints that come from that. So the first thing is this L2 orbit. Uh, it's chosen to have, uh, to use relatively little fuel. You can maintain an orbit there. It's a halo orbit so that the Earth never blocks the sun. So you're continually getting sun on the, on the, solar, uh, the solar panels. And um, yeah, I guess that's all I wanted to say there. Um, here's the bottom side of the, of the spacecraft again. You'll hear about the instruments uh, from other people, which is on the other side. Um, the, Left-hand side there, that shield to balance the torque. In the movie, there was a comment that went by that said you want to balance the center of pressure with the center of mass, basically, of the telescope. Um, but it, it doesn't work at all possible orientations of the telescope. So when you point in, uh, a little bit off nominal, you get a torque one way on the spacecraft. And when you point the opposite way, you get a torque in the other direction. So ideally, you would schedule it so you go back and forth using the reaction wheels, and you never have to use any propellant uh, to um, bleed momentum from the reaction wheels. But astronomers have good ideas about I want to observe here at this time, or I want to do a large mosaic off nominal roll, or I want to do coronography, or, or, or who knows what. So um, this thing helps at least balance it on average. And then the rest of it comes from the scientists working with the uh, operations staff at the operations center, trading off between uh, using propellant for you know, bleeding momentum from reaction wheels and, and doing glorious science. <coughs> the high gain antenna, um, let's see, I just wanted to tell you, the, it's 57 gigabytes of data per day. The movie I showed you is 57 gigabytes. So it doesn't seem like that much, right? But it's actually, um, each detector has four amplifiers that are usually used in parallel. And this data rate is basically enough to let you read four amplifiers worth of data, uh, get it down to the ground continuously. I mean, it's, it's um, queued up in a solid state recorder for half a day and then downloaded. But the data rate is basically one detector, four amplifiers continuously. Now, JWST has you know, uh, way more than NearSpec has two detectors, MIRI has three, NearCam has 10, right? So you can't use NearCam continuously all the time downlinking every frame. So they have to be co-added, not always, but when, you, when it makes sense scientifically, you should all try to co-add because that's being a good neighbor to the other programs that need to, need to use the, the data volume. Also, the antenna is steerable, so we don't have to stop observing to downlink data. And uh, when it moves, uh, it will probably introduce a little jitter in the spacecraft temporarily. So for most of the uh, observing programs, we will not be exposed, we'll move it when we're not exposing. But for the very long exposures, like for the exoplanet time series, it'll, we'll just move the telescope in the middle and, and a few of the exposures, uh, integrations actually, will be disturbed, but then we'll be back on track after that. And then there's some star trackers here. Um, I guess I'll just point them out here and uh, in other places. Um, 
that's what, uh, when, we're, when we're slewing without being guiding, that, that, that's what tells us which way we're pointing. And then even when we're guiding, where we're, we have the X and Y axes, if you will, uh, locked on to a guide star, we still have to have some way to keep ourselves from rotating. And these star trackers are what do that. They, they look out at, at all the bright stars elsewhere on the sky and, and keep the rotation right. All right. Now, um, so I just want you to get in your head uh, uh, how this sun shield constrains where the telescope can point. Um, obviously, the sun has to be on the far side from the, from the telescope and the instruments. Um, you, this is the nominal orientation, and you can tip the telescope forward by five degrees and no more. So that's 85 degrees from the sun, basically. And the, re the reason is if you go any further, you start to ris run the risk of heating the secondary mirror, which would then be poking out on the front end of the, of the sun shield. You can also point 45 degrees more away from, you know, 135 degrees away from the sun. If you went farther than that, you would start risking heating the backside of the telescope, uh, right? So there's 50 degrees here, and you can rotate the telescope like this all the way around, and that's what makes the blue shaded region. That's called the field of regard, the instantaneous field of regard. JWST can point anywhere in that shaded blue region at this particular time. Um, the one other thing that you have to keep in mind is, is the, the, the last axis is rotating like this, all right? And you can't rotate very far before the edge of the telescope peeks out from behind the sun shield, and that would be bad because you would then have these thermal transients that you'd heat, the, heat that edge and, and it would be bad. So we're only going to roll plus or minus five degrees. So if you imagine you were looking at something in the ecliptic pole up at the top of this diagram, um, if you wanted a particular orientation, you couldn't get it at any, just any time of year. There's only uh, 10 degrees out of 30, 360, 10 days out of the year when you can see a particular orientation. All right. And then there's a little continuous viewing zone there. But as this chart shows, the continuous viewing zone is, uh, it's actually not as important as it is for Hubble. It's still great, right? But with Hubble, if you look in the continuous viewing zone, that means you don't have Earth occultations, you know, once every 96 minutes, which are a pain. Here, uh, it's true that uh, if you want to be able to look at any time of year, you have to be in the continuous viewing zone. But um, actually, even uh, on the ecliptic equator, zero in this plot uh, on the x-axis, you still get a 50-day long window when you can observe a target. So uh, uh, that's really good for almost, almost all purposes. Uh, the only, only place it's not good is uh, if you're doing commissioning and you want to make sure that you have a target. You want to, make, you know, you want to be up here more. But for most science targets, um, there's lots of opportunities during the, sometime during the year to observe things. All right. I think that's all I wanted to say there. So um, I'm going to skip the two science motivation slides because Pierre already covered them. So four science themes, general observatory, uh, good stuff. Uh, now I want to spend three slides talking about the life of a, a, a JWST program. The first slide is the proposal phase. Um, this is much like HST structurally, but there are some differences. I'll go through it all in case you didn't. So the first step is great idea, right? Great science idea. So that, that's on the astronomers to figure that out. Um, and then the next step is to calculate and um, just to estimate your exposure times to see if what you're thinking is reasonable. Uh, the exposure times uh, calculator for JWST is completely reworked from the ground up, uh, and it's much fancier, uh, which could also be called more complicated, but uh, you know, it's very capable, let's put it that way. Um, it's called Pandea. Uh, then you specify your observations, still using APT, which is the framework for the HST thing, but it is different, and I have uh, some slides later showing you how it's different. We're gonna, we are using templates for JWST rather than specifying individual filter wheel moves, individual exposures, and so forth, and I'll explain why later. And then because things are specified at a, at a higher level, the visit planner for JWST is not trying to figure out how to fit in orbital wind occultation, you know, uh, vis visibility periods for each orbit. It's for figuring out how uh, a high level specified observation breaks out into individual visits. Then you write the science justification like HST, submit the pro proposal, the TAC evaluates them and the director allocates the time, all like HST. Next phase is execution. Uh, so we have program coordinators that make sure that everything is syntactically correct, do other checks. We'll have, especially for cycle one, uh, uh, contact scientist reviews of all accepted programs just to make sure that uh, 
uh, things look good, that the right choices have been made for the template parameters, because even though there's very few parameters, it, you still have to make wise choices. Um, then we build a long range plan, just lay everything out into a, a long calendar, see when, when things can schedule, see if there are times of the year that are oversubscribed or undersubscribed, react accordingly. And then, as with HST, build short-term schedules, you know, weekly schedules. There, there'll be teams that build alternating or, or every three weeks schedules, and, uh, and those will get uploaded to the spacecraft. Uh, and then, uh, by the flight operations folks that are in the Mission Operations Center that I showed you. Then, on board, we have uh, onboard scripts that will read the, the visit plans that were updated, or were uploaded, sorry, and execute. Uh, and I'll have a few words to say about how that happens at the end of the talk. And then finally download the data. So that's the end of the execution phase. Then uh, for the data phase, um, processing the data the first time uh, is split into two categories. There's science data processing, which goes from packets into your first FITS file and brings in stuff from internal databases that people outside the Space Telescope can't access and generate an uh, you know, sort of a, a initial FITS file that isn't calibrated yet but has all sorts of information in its header. Then the calibration process, which you can and will repeat later yourself if you want, um, takes it from there and, you know, wavelength calibration, flux calibration, um, turning the up the ramp things into a, into a count rate image, making mosaics, all sorts of stuff like that, which we'll, you'll hear about later. I won't go into more detail there. The archive ingests the data products, which is much more complicated than it sounds. Um, uh, now, back to the astronomers. You will discover your data or somebody else's data by using uh, the multi-mission uh, uh, portal that we provide at Space Telescope. So JWST products will be served up with that portal. Um, unlike HST, well, unlike HST used to be, I guess it still is, um, all the data, once they're processed, will be just be sitting there uh, with URLs that you can download if, if you have authorization. If it's, if it's public data, you can just get the URL and download it or use curl scripts to download a bunch. And, so, and it won't be a request the data and then have it delivered or have it deposited in a directory and then you can download it. It'll all be direct access, which I think will be, make a, a, a huge difference. Um, the pipeline will be distributed. It's based in Python. It's written from the ground up. Um, it'll be uh, relatively easy for uh, talented programmers to, I mean, you know, Python coders to add a step, change a step, delete a step, things like that. Hopefully, some of that work that gets done by the community can come back into the into the pipeline uh, for for use at, uh, in our initial processing. Uh, we're also investing some effort into uh, developing tools uh, in AstroPy and layered on top of AstroPy. Uh, and then uh, I publish results, and I say promptly because it's nominal five-year lifetime, right? And so, if you sit on your data for two or three years, that means there'll be one chance for the community to follow up on your glorious results that you published in a proposal cycle and get their data. It would be much better if, you know, we could have two or three intellectual cycles in the first five years where people get their first results out quickly, other people see it and go, wow, that's really interesting, I have another idea, and so forth. So um, publishing promptly will be important for this mission. All right, um, three slides about templates. Um, so this is what APT, this is little cutouts from APT in the top, you have to select which instrument you want, and then that uh, informs the template menu, and each instrument currently has four science templates, which are listed here, and then you have to pick one of those, temp one of those. and in this particular example, I've got um, Neris doing wide-field slitless spectroscopy, so that's this up here, and you can see uh, there's a couple observations to find over here. Um, one of them is up right now, it's this one, uh, and you have to choose various things, like uh, which filter do you want? And if you want to do another filter, you actually have to do another observation. Um, so uh, the, um, the templates uh, have the, uh, the main advantage, as I said at the bottom of this slide, of uh, simplifying the system design. All right? It's not like we have to handle all possible combinations uh, in all the way through the system, from the observer specifying it to executing it on board to processing the data and making high-level data products. If, if anything is possible, then it's very expensive to build and to test a system to handle all that. So the templates are good for us in that it restricts the number of possibilities. It also uh, simplifies program preparation for you. It doesn't make it trivial because you still have to figure out what values to put in for the parameters. It also limits the possibilities at some level, but we've tried very hard with input from the science teams and scientists at, at, at Space Telescope to cover 
uh, as much of uh, scientific parameter space as possible while, while working in this template framework. All right, um, a little bit of terminology, uh, which is really important to have uh, <laughs> clear discussions of, of JWST. Um, so a program consists of one or more observations. I, an observation is when you fill out one of those templates. In the example I showed you, there were two observations. You can see it in the hierarchical uh, editor on uh, uh, menu on the left there, right? There's, uh, so each time you fill out a template, you get an observation. But an observation uh, will split when you run the visit planner into one or you know ten or a hundred visits which will schedule their separate scheduling units. They'll schedule at different times. So the observation is a high-level construct. I mean, it could mean different, it means different things to us in normal parlance, but in JWST lingo, an observation is a very high-level construct. And then the visits are things that happen under the hood. You can see them in APT, but the only way you can affect them is by changing your uh, parameters. And there, you can't just easily delete one visit. You have, there's a, you know, it does what it wants. The, the system uh, lays out the visits the way it wants to. Uh, and then a visit has one guide star acquisition. And if you think back to Pierre's uh, diagram of the focal plane, the FGS fields of view are just little squares. They're, they're no larger than the other instrument fields of view. So if you want to do a mosaic, like you, which you can specify a whole mosaic in one observation, it has to break into multiple visits because the way we define a visit is you begin with a guide star acquisition in the FGS and then you start doing your science. All right? So, and then the scheduling system, it makes a sequence of these visits and we upload it, you know, from the spacecraft and they're not all from your observation. There's one from yours, three from mine, two from somebody else's, back to yours and so on. Whatever, whatever makes sense in the global scheduling sense. All right, so now uh, the last uh, two content slides, I wanna talk a little bit about how things happen on board. I mentioned that there were scripts on board. You upload uh, the visit descriptions, and then there are scripts that interpret those visit descriptions. Um, we use, uh, it's the, from the beginning, the design for JWST has been event driven, which means HST said, okay, we're gonna wait the long, you know, everything is on a specific uh, timed clock, and, and we're gonna wait till this time, and then start this visit. We're gonna move this filter wheel, and we're gonna wait the maximum amount of time it could take, and then so forth. With JWST, every little bit the command is sent and then we wait for a confirmation that it succeeded and then we immediately move on to the next thing in the sequence and that's true for visits as well. Each visit as a whole has a start window, a beginning start time, uh, earliest start time and an end, end uh, latest start time. If uh, the previous visit finishes and we're within the start window of the next visit in the list, we just kick off execution immediately. Um, if we, the previous visit ended and we're before the earliest time to start it, uh, JWST will sit there and wait until the window opens and then it will execute that visit. This will happen, uh, for example, when you have a very tight timing window. Like, let's, say, let's say you want to observe an exoplanet and you have to start your exposure at the right time so that you cover the transit, right? Um, the timing model has uncertainties in it for reasons we can go into. Uh, for example, uh, if you well, uh, fail a guide star acquisition once, you try again with a different guide star. So you don't know for sure the timing to within five minutes because of that. And other things can add up too. You can fail whole visits. So the timing is uncertain. You could arrive early. Uh, it'll just sit there and wait. Um, that actually is a form of overhead sitting for the observatory, sitting and waiting uh, for a fixed time inter, uh, event to, for its window to open. If you show up, it, uh, if the previous visit ends after the, the, the start window for, for the next visit, it'll just get skipped and it'll have to be rescheduled at another time. All right, um, so visit constraints that you all will put on your programs, that I will put on my programs, they will reduce the scheduling efficiency. If all you care about is can I point in, in, in the instantaneous field of regard, that light blue uh, shaded region I showed, then the windows are huge and there's really no problem at all. If, uh, if you put a role constraint in, like I wanna have a particular orient, then if you're at the ecliptic pole, like I uh, mentioned earlier, it's, it's plus or minus five degrees out of uh, 360 degrees. That's a 10 day window. So that's starting to get a little tight. If you're doing coronography where you wanna do minus five degrees and plus five degrees, now it's really tight, okay? Now it's down to a day or less, depending on uh, what, how much of a, a, a roll difference you want. And if you do the exoplanet thing, 
you're allowed to make the timing window as tight as five minutes. I will argue tomorrow that that's unwise and you should put an hour in or something like that. But we can talk about that tomorrow. All right, so, uh, oh, and I just wanted to show, yeah, this one example. Uh, I don't, didn't really, I couldn't, <laughs> it's hard to make a good diagram, so I stole this. All I really want you to see here is these are the start windows for three visits in sequence. And uh, the visit here ends. This one, it's in the start window, so it begins. But then the guide star acquisition fails. Both guide stars, all three guide stars were not found for whatever reason. So it just jumps down here. Fortunately, this timing window is large enough that this could begin right away. Um, and it would have been fine too if this visit had ended. It would, have, it would have succeeded as well. So that's just a visual diagram to help uh, uh, emphasize some of the points I was making on the previous slide. So uh, just to go through the points I tried to cover, commissioning will be a very busy six months. Uh, the Sun Shield has operational impacts on where you can point, how you can roll, things like that. Um, I skipped over the JWC is a general purpose observatory. Uh, the life of a program, uh, we got the proposal phase, which is similar but different in some ways from Hubble. Execution uh, and then the data phase. Observers will specify observations using a template, which is new, and that is something that you can and should start thinking about. There will be people talking about APT and the templates here at this meeting. Uh, and then event-driven operations has uh, some implications on uh, efficiency and choices you make about constraining your observations. Thanks. Thank you.